Well, welcome to our fifth class, our fifth couples class of this quarter. We have now entered the month of April, and today we're going to be talking, basically we're going to talk about unity, but one of the books that I introduced the first week um, uh, titles a section, The Unity Principle, and so we're going to be looking particularly at a passage from Genesis. You might be able to guess which one it is. Uh, the two shall be one flesh, and uh, the author builds a principle from this, which is obviously very, very biblical and very, very good for us. And so uh, today, once again, we'll be talking about unity. And a couple, a married couple needs to be one. A married couple needs to be united no matter what. And, well, I've done I guess there could be some exceptions. Jesus gives one, adultery. Uh, but in the general sense, and as we move through our lives in a general way, we we need to be united. And I'm going to use the last four lessons to just point out we need to be united, despite the fact that there might be intimacy problems. And I don't mean in the bedroom exclusively, but just intimacy in general, the idea of being close, the idea of being one with each other. And we talked about intimacy the first week. And you know what? Jennifer and I and every other couple in the world, we're not going to get that perfectly right in this life because it's a fallen world. We are fallen people. We are sinful people. We are saved people and we are empowered people by the Holy Spirit, but we are still going to have issues. Unity despite love problems. You know what? I'm never going to love anyone in this world, including Jennifer, the way I ought to. I am going to mess up. And the level, the depth of my love is not going to be ideal at times. And uh, I would almost say all the time, it's never going to be ideal. It's never going to be perfect. And hers for me. And so the, the only perfect love is the love that God gives, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we move in that direction. I think we love better now than we did 30 years ago. And I think people grow in love. But you know what? There are going to be some love problems. There are going to be some forgiveness problems. There might be something where uh, one person in a married relationship will, will not feel that they've been forgiven appropriately, or maybe they realize that they're holding a grudge or being a little embittered in their life. Well, there are going to be forgiveness problems. There are going to be differences of opinion, maybe even on forgiveness. But you know what? Despite that, we need to be unit. We need to be in unity. We need to be unified as a couple. We need to be so far with this unity that the Bible says we need to be one. And what uh, Ron shared with us last week, we need to be in unity despite communication problems. Yes, we need to realize that we also have different ways that we communicate with each other. And despite those differences, we need to be one, one in, one with each other and one in Jesus Christ. Well, I mentioned that uh, from the first week, I'd already mentioned this book, but this idea of the unity principle is one of the headings and one of the sections in the Marriage Improvement Project. And this is really a devotional uh, guide. Uh, gives We're going to look at a few of the prayer ideas under this topic. And um, a really uh, a neat little book if you want something to help you move along and think about different things in marriage. Well, the, the main verse is 24, but I'd like to lead into that, starting in 18. This is from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper 
fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. We notice in this, the Lord God is the one at work. The Lord God is the one who created the beasts of the, the land and the air and the sea. And the Lord God is the one who brought them to Adam to name. The Lord God is the one who caused the deep sleep and formed and created the woman. The Lord God remains even today and will for all eternity. The Lord God will remain faithful to us. He will love us. He will be loyal to us. He will be steadfast in those things. We are called to respond. We are called to appreciate. We are called to transform our lives in his direction, according to his will. And then, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, of course, the one flesh, this is a, a, a nice way of saying they will have sexual relations, they will become one, but it's beyond that. And we know it's beyond that because of the travesty, the, the tragedy, when a man or a woman um, is not loyal to that covenant, that commitment to the other, when one goes off and has an affair when one goes off and has a fling that is inappropriate. And we know that this verse, particularly this verse, is so important because it is cited in the Gospels. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 6.16 and in Ephesians 5.31. The principle of unity, the principle of one flesh, is throughout Scripture. And so this is really the one flesh principle, as the author of the book mentions, but also uses this phrase, marriage is a total union of two people in every area of life. And the emphasis being made is that the two are one, no matter what's going on. I like to go and golf. And... Occasionally, I do okay, <laughs> but not lately. <laughs> but anyway, that's beside the point. But I like to do that. Well, Jennifer does not golf. Now, occasionally, she'll come out and ride in the golf cart and hang out with me if we're on a little trip together or something. But we are still one, even if I'm doing something different. When Jennifer is teaching at her school, I don't as often as I should, but I pray for her. And I pray for her students, and I pray for just the the education part of it. Uh, but she's at a private Christian school, so I can pray. Well, I could pray for it anyway, but I pray particularly for the spiritual side of things there. Pray for the school in general. So even though she's off doing that, and I am not a part of that, and she's away, we're apart from each other during the day, we're still one. And that's part of what this author is getting at in every area of life. It doesn't matter if I'm golfing and she is playing with the dogs at home. It doesn't matter if she's teaching at school and I'm doing something here at the church building. It doesn't matter what's happening. We are still one. And it is a total union. If you recall our lesson from uh, week one on intimacy, it can be tough to be one with another person. it There is a sense in which it's the death of the individual and the new life of the couple. 
And then the author of that book uh, on intimacy, Mike Mason, points out that, uh, uh, you know what, that uh, is exactly what happens when uh, a couple, when they finally pass away and they've left behind offspring. But it's tough. It can be tough. And so, but it needs to be a total union of the two people in every area of life. One of the quotes in the chapter is, it's hard work to change your mindset from independent and self-centered to one of constant consideration and care for another person. And I would agree with that statement. That's not an easy thing to do. And it really is part of the transformation that we are undergoing throughout our lives in Jesus Christ. One of my favorite passages, as many of you know, is Colossians 3, because it talks about the mind. And Paul writes here, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, I don't always think it's appropriate to kind of substitute ideas in a passage. But here I think it's okay because, you know what? The marriage relationship, it's a godly thing. And so if I recognize that I have been raised with Christ, so let's just let's move through these verses once again. If I recognize that, and if I am seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, I'm going to be a better husband. There's just no doubt about it. If I forget that I belong to Christ and I am not seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, I can guarantee you I'm not going to be as good of a husband. I'm not going to be as good of a Christian. I'm not going to be as good of a man a human being. If I don't set my minds on, if I don't set, <laughs> well, now we're getting into uh, some uh, dangerous territory, uh, my mental health, but I'm kidding. Um, I, I, my mind is singular. So if I don't set my mind on things that are above and I rather set them on, set my mind on things that are on earth, I'm going to be in trouble as well. It says here, set your mind on things that are above. And if I do that, and I don't set my mind on things that are on earth, I again will be a better husband. I need to remember that I have died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is my very life, appears, then I also will appear with him in glory. And you know what? I want all of that for Jennifer as well. So we can work together, unified, to move in a spiritually stronger direction. It is hard work to change your mindset from independent and self-centered to one of constant consideration and care for another person. But you know what? With As is the case with everything in Christianity, it is worth it. And our marriages must be rooted and grounded in Christianity, in Jesus Christ. And then we will be able to change our mindsets. Our hard work absolutely will pay off. Do we do it for the payoff? Well, we all want good marriages. We all want good relationships. We all want to be good people. So in that sense, yes. But we do things just because it's the godly thing to do. We do things because it gives glory to God. Is heaven given as a motivation for good living? In scripture, absolutely. Is not wanting to go to hell a motivation to do the right thing? Absolutely, yes. We ultimately do things for the glory of God. There are great benefits, in fact, eternal benefits to centering our lives in the right way. This can start for us in prayer. But I do want to emphasize that we can't just pray and all the bad things in life go away and all the good things in life come our way. That doesn't happen that way. God doesn't do it that way. 
God allows us to be part of the process. So we have to put in effort as well. But our prayers are like incense before the throne. And I don't want us to ever forget that. Revelation 5, 7 to 10. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Our prayers are right there in heaven. Our prayers are right there in the throne room. Absolutely incredible. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. We used this passage in our Malachi class Thursday night, and and I'll just tell you, to build unity in a marriage, to remember that we are priests, to remember in most of our cases that our spouse is a priest, a priest to our God. If I can just get my mind turned the right way and realize who I am and who Jennifer is, then how can I not want to be one? How can I not want to have unity? How can I not want to build that relationship in as good a way as I possibly can in this life? It is motivating to realize who God is, who we are, and the relationship that we share. It is motivating to remember what Jesus did for us. All right, so in the book, there were several prayer suggestions throughout this section on unity. The first one's a very general one. In fact, there's uh, uh, some of this is very general. This first one I almost didn't put in, but I thought, you know what? Some, some of us need to be reminded of some of these things. So this first prayer suggestion is to take some time to quiet yourself. And prepare for what God has in store for you in today's lesson. And so we could we could maybe take off the today's lesson part, but you get the idea. We do need to take time. We do need to be proactive. We need to be willing to just step back. And I know for, for Jennifer and for me, that's a little easier. Our children are 29, 26, and 23 at this moment, and they don't live in our house. We have two dogs who make it a little hard sometimes to have quiet time, but it's a little different than those of you who have toddlers, infants, kids in elementary school, and even middle school and high school and college. Um, it's a We're in a whole different situation and things are a little easier, but no matter what your situation is, no matter how hard it might be to find a moment of quiet, uh, it's still very important to try to find and take time and kind of prepare yourself for what you're going to learn when you read the Bible or what you're going to learn from your kids or what you're going to learn from your spouse, what you're going to learn even at work or at school. God has things in store for us. Let's be ready to accept them, to be open to them. And let's use these things that God has in store for us to build unity in our relationships. And obviously, in this class, we're particularly talking about the relationship that we have with our spouse. All right, a second prayer suggestion. Ask the Lord to do supernatural things to facilitate a greater sense of unity between you and your spouse as you endeavor to do your part in applying what you're learning. We do not have miracles today, but God has not stopped working. So I like this wording, and we need to always realize that the Father, Son, and Spirit have not stopped working. Things have not stopped. God has not disengaged himself from us. He does things. We believe that or we wouldn't pray. 
So let's ask him to do things to facilitate this unity. If we care about unity, let's pray about unity. And let's ask him to do stuff. We don't know what that might be, but let's ask him to work in this for our benefit and blessing. And God wants to do things like that. A third, take a few moments to ask the Lord to remind you of his heart for your marriage relationship. Ask him to make your marriage healthy, strong, and full of his presence. This relates to Colossians 3. What are we thinking about? Are we thinking about the world's way that they look at marriages? Or are we thinking about the way God looks at a marriage? Are we thinking about things in a heavenly way or an earthly way? Are we thinking about things above or things on the earth? These all fit together. So let's take a few minutes to ask him to remind us of his heart. What does God want for your marriage? Well, he wants it to be healthy, strong, and full of him. Absolutely. The next one, ask the Lord to open your heart to him in greater ways today. Be engaged and proactive in the moment. Ask him to show you how you can better apply the unity principle, as this author puts it, we could just the principle found in Genesis 2:24. We don't necessarily need to label it something different. Uh, this person obviously was writing a book and did. But the one flesh principle, the Genesis 2:24 principle, ask him how to remove barriers to it that exist in your own heart. What do I have in inside me? that is hindering unity? What kind of selfishness or pride or resentment? What, what things are going on inside that make it hard to have unity uh, with my spouse? And then the final one, consider the Lord's presence with you today. He has promised to be with you through his Holy Spirit as your guide, teacher, and counselor. Ask him to lead you today. Now, again, this prayer suggestion obviously is applicable to any Christian in the world. I mean, this is something we all should be asking on a regular basis, and we could even make an argument continually as we constantly are in communion uh, with the Lord. But ask him to lead you today. And if you're about to do something that shows a lack of love, impatience, keeping record of wrongs, a lack of kindness, if you're about to do something just take a moment and ask him to lead you in that moment. I do like these prayer suggestions and how they are very specific to the now. Not just, I tend to pray, I tend to pray very specifically about some things, but I also tend to pray very generically sometimes. Lord, help me, help my faith to grow. Um, help me to be more spiritual. And those are, those are fine prayers. I'm not discounting those at all. But I like the author's suggestions here that are very specific to right now. So when confronted or when living out this situation in life, let's make sure we pray this. Let's consider this. Let's ask for a path on which to tread. All right. And then another just comment from the uh, chapter each partner should make the development of this attitude a conscious and intentional goal, leaning on the Lord for his help in doing so. You may need to make a project of this, being one flesh, being unified. You may need to make a project of this, taking intentional steps to renew your mind. Quoting here Romans 12, 2, to renew your mind along these lines day after day. And I have Romans 12. I put verse 1 in there also. I am known for giving bonus verses. So here they are, or here it is, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So this idea of taking up our crosses, dying to self daily, uh, getting rid of our will and putting the Lord's will in its place, this idea is for all of Christianity. But 
think about how great a difference it makes when we do this in a marriage. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This testing is and I didn't get this for, for many, many years of my Christian walk. And then finally, it kind of was made clear by various teachers and commentaries and things. But the, the testing being talked about here is we test it by living it out. And so we live out the will of God and we find that, of course, we know this, it's good, acceptable, and perfect, but we test it out. We, lived it, we live it out and it is confirmed in this way. So we read something like 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Okay, well, we try patience for a while. We test it. Do I have more joy and peace if I'm patient or when I ignore God's command to be patient? Same with kindness, same with keeping record of wrongs, same with delighting in evil. What kind of, we test it. And of course, you always find out that God's will is the way to peace, the way to joy, the way to love, the way that is in sync with the spirit. And so that's what we're talking about here. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't just do it the way everyone else is doing it. Don't do your marriage the way everyone else is doing it. Be transformed. Do it differently. And I'd like, for this recorded session, I'd like to end with John 17, 20 to 23. Jesus, this is called the high priestly prayer. It's his, uh, he's nearing the cross and he is praying. This, this could have been part of the prayer in the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, that's how close we are to his death when he prays this. He says, I don't ask for these only, and what he means by that is the ones near him, his, his apostles, his disciples uh, that are part of his life physically right then and there. I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So that's all of us, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Now, there's a whole lot in this verse, these verses, besides what's in yellow on your screen. But this is the emphasis I want us to see in this moment, <laughs> that they may all be one, that they may be one, that they may become perfectly one. Jesus wants Christians, this is talking about all Christians here, he wants Christians to be one. And how are they to be one? Just as the Son and the Father are one. even as we are one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that the, And then notice, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. And at the end, so that the world may know that you sent me, he says again, and loved them, even as you loved me. God wants all Christians to be one. Well, of course that applies to the Christian who is our spouse. It applies to all of us. Let's be motivated. Let's be engaged in these things. Let's pray about them. And then put into action items, maybe something a day that you can do to enhance unity, enhance oneness, as opposed to things that cause division. Speaking of division, next week, 
conflict resolution. All right. Well, I appreciate your being here. May the Lord continue to bless us and particularly in our marriages as we study his word and his ways.